the NWSL. Wait, hold on. Before I go there, I think it's important to rewind a bit and figure out how we got here in the first place. July 10th, 1999, Rose Bowl, Pasadena, California. It's the Women's World Cup Final between the hosts, USA, and China. Scoreless after 90 minutes and scoreless after extra time and the penalty kick shootout, Brianna Scurry save, which looks a little bit off the line, has set up this moment. Brandy Chastain, a chance to give the United States their second World Cup trophy. The most iconic moment in U.S. soccer history. A moment that surely inspired tens of thousands of girls in this country to pick up the game of soccer. With the popularity of women's soccer at an all-time high, it made sense to launch a professional league. The WUSA, or Women's United Soccer Association, was announced in 2000 and just a year later began play in 2001. Eight teams and all the big money players were there. Ham, Chastain, Scurry, Overbeck, Milbert, Foudy, as well as many of the other World Cup stars from other countries. Multiple investors poured in millions to help start the league up. And its TV deal? Actually pretty legit. Having games on both national and local markets. Running on the momentum from the 99 World Cup, the first game, a matchup between the Washington Freedom and Bay Area Cyber Rays... <laughs> Yeah, what a name that is. It was Ham versus Chastain, 34,000 in attendance. It seemed like the WUSA had everything going for it. And then it folded. After three seasons. I'm going to say something that's going to piss some people off. And I'm not saying this applies to everyone. I'm not saying this applies to you or to me. I'm just saying for a lot of people, women's sports is a tough sell. It's a lot of people that are just not into it. It is what it is. Now the women's national soccer team, yeah, absolutely loved it. They're very popular. But as it turns out, national team popularity doesn't automatically translate to the club level. Also. <laughs> It doesn't help that the league completely dropped the ball on its finances. Basically, the WUSA set a budget for $40 million to last them five seasons. And they burned through that $40 million in just one season. Remember, starting up any professional league is really hard. Think about all the ones that came and went, the ones that flopped and went under. In order to succeed, I really believe you have got to be able to cut corners and save as much money as you can. And in the WUSA, there were players making up to 80000 a year. I know that doesn't sound like a lot for a professional athlete, but for a startup league in 2001, yeah, that's a lot of money. All this time they were expecting to make a ton of money, and they didn't. They just lost a ton of money. And that's why the league couldn't make it. Up next was the WPS, the Women's Professional Soccer. Feels like it's missing a letter, doesn't it? I don't know, the, the name WPS always sounded awkward to me. Now, this league was arguably even more of a mess than the WUSA, because unlike that league, this league couldn't get help from anyone. They had minimal sponsors, a much worse TV deal. You had teams dropping out left and right every season. And in one case, St. Louis Athletica, they even dropped out mid-season in 2010 because they couldn't make their payments. And sitting here and really thinking about it, yeah, maybe trying to start a league right after a horrible recession in this country, that's maybe not the best timing. And in one case, Magic Jack, which, yes, that was the name of the team. They were named after the Phone Jack Company. Their owner, Dan Borislau, sued a WPS because the league voted to terminate the franchise because of, quote, unprofessional and disparaging treatment of his players and failure to pay his bills. Fun fact, Abby Wambach was actually player coach of that team at one time. 
The WPS wanted more of a grassroots system, meaning they wanted the league to grow in popularity organically through the local markets. They wanted word of mouth to spread around the community, and not just because of national exposure. I mean, okay, that's noble and all, but like, you need something to kickstart it. So, that league folded, once again, after three seasons, but just a few months later, the NWSL, or the National Women's Soccer League, was announced. Yeah, we're like five minutes in on this. It's about time I get to the NWSL. Here we go again, right? Here comes another league. Let's all get excited for a year and then find out a little later just how much money the league is losing and we'll see it go under in about three seasons, right? Wrong, actually very wrong. Because as it turns out, the NWSL is different. The NWSL is being smart. Looking at the two previous failures, the NWSL realized that if they wanted a chance to make it, they could not be spending the amounts of money like before in the WSA and WPS. Unfortunately, this meant that the players had to play for peanuts. In the inaugural season 2013, for unallocated players, which I'll explain what that means in a minute, the team cap was set at $200,000 maximum salary of 30,000, minimum salary of 6,000. And yes, certain expenses were covered like housing, healthcare, a car and whatnot. But even still, that means for players on the low end, they needed a second job just to get by. But the tough part is, is that a lot of people view these low salaries from both the NWSL and other lower soccer divisions on the men's side, they view it as disrespect. Listen, I want all the players to be able to make enough money and live comfortably. However, these low salaries, especially when the league is first starting, they're kind of necessary. I mean, creating and running a soccer team is a huge risk. You saw what happened when the previous two women's leagues folded. It was because they lost too much money. The reality is that this is a tough life, unless you make it to the top. And for women soccer players, the top is making it to the national team. And yeah, speaking of the national team, I'd imagine it'd be pretty hard to convince the stars to accept a maximum of just $30,000. Well, remember when I said unallocated players? This is what I'm talking about. The national team stars, not just from the US, but also from Canada and Mexico, they are not considered unallocated players. No, they were actually allocated players. Well, actually, they were named that, and then they were named subsidized players, and now I think they're called federation players. Whatever. The name isn't that important. Just know that they are not unallocated players. This means these players can make well over the maximum salary. I kind of liken it to NWSL's version of designated players. Now, here's the kicker. Most of the salary of these allocated players aren't being paid by the NWSL teams. Nope. Actually, they're being paid by the soccer federations themselves. Yes, the US Soccer Federation is paying the salary for the national team players on the NWSL teams, which is actually kind of genius if you think about it. Because obviously these national team stars are the main attraction for these teams. But instead of the NWSL paying an arm and a leg to land these players and ultimately probably end up losing money off them, now they get the star power for almost free. And for the federations themselves, this is an expense they're willing to make because they know the benefit of having these star players playing close to home. And with this strategy of saving every penny they can get, the league has started to build some stability. And slowly but surely, the league is paying more and more every season. In the NWSL's fifth season, the team cap jumped to 315,000, with the minimum salary being 15,000 and the maximum being 41,000. And now, in the league's ninth season, the team cap has jumped up to 682,000, with the minimum salary being 22,000 and the maximum salary being 52,000. I mean, okay, I know, there's still not huge numbers, but comparing these numbers to 2013, 
yeah, I'd say the league is progressing quite nicely. Also, it should be noted that in the first nine years of the league's existence, U.S. soccer sort of acted as like the manager for the league. They made all the main decisions. Well, now the NWSL has ended that relationship. It is now the NWSL calling all the shots. However, the federations will still pay the federation players. This is another sign of financial stability because this wasn't like a messy divorce where the two sides like hated each other. No, there was an understanding between both parties that in the beginning, yes, the NWSL needed US soccer and now they don't. So it was a good relationship for both and now it's time to move on. Speaking of relationships, many of the NWSL teams are affiliated with men's teams from MLS and USL. You also have OL Reign affiliated with Lyon of Ligue 1 of France. I feel like this is something the WUSA and even WPS try to avoid. I guess they wanted to, I don't know, do it on their own. But I just think it's smart business from an owner standpoint. I mean, first of all, the stadium situation is pretty easy. You could just share the place. I mean, if the NWSL didn't want these affiliations, we never would have gotten the Portland Thorns, a team that regularly averages more than multiple MLS teams in attendance. Yeah, they're kind of like the Atlanta United of the NWSL in which they are the clear runaway favorites in the attendance game. But even still, there has never been anything close to the Portland Thorns in either the WUSA or WPS. One thing I find interesting, though, is that all of these teams with male affiliate teams still have their own unique identities. Yes, some of them have same color schemes like Orlando Pride with Orlando City both being purple and Houston Dash with Houston Dynamo both being orange, but they're still different names. And that's not always the case around the world. In England, they have the Women's Super League, but all of the clubs share the same name as the male counterpart. You have the Arsenal women's team, the Manchester United women's team, etc. The same deal with La Liga for the most part. You have the Barcelona women's team, the Real Madrid women's team, etc. Okay, I really wouldn't be that upset if these NWSL teams adopted the same names as the MLS or USL teams that they're affiliated to. But at the same time, I could say I definitely prefer it like this. I like that all these NWSL teams have their own branding. It adds a level of uniqueness to the league. Okay, I know, I've been going on and on about these partnerships with men's teams, and while I do think it's a smart strategy, I also like that the league isn't becoming overly reliant on these affiliations. You have multiple teams that aren't affiliated with anyone and still doing just fine. For instance, Kansas City, they just announced a new $70 million stadium, all privately funded. That's amazing. We have never seen anything like this before. I know, Wake Med Park in Cary, North Carolina, that was originally built for the Carolina Courage in the WUSA in 2002, but that was only like a $14.5 million park. This $70 million stadium is going to be truly one of the gems in this country. And you know what? I don't think they'll be the last team to build their own stadium. Because it seems like every year of the NWSL, the league is spending increases a little bit, the TV deals get a little better with more ways to watch the game, the attendance gets a little better, and the TV ratings are getting a lot better, with numbers being almost up 500% last year. The Challenge Cup, which remember was the bubble tournament in Salt Lake City last year, had over 650,000 people watching the final. Those are more than just decent numbers. No, it's not perfect. There have been teams that didn't make it and had to fold, particularly in the beginning. And it's very clear with the No More Side Hustles movement that the NWSL's Players Association is not happy with the pay, and they want more. Also, given what's happened with the Paul Riley sexual coercion scandal and stories now coming out about other front offices not respecting some of the players, there is a level of mistrust between the players and the league that needs to be addressed and the NWSL is still trying to attract a widespread audience. Yes, the fans are passionate, but the league is still fighting to become mainstream, as is every club soccer league based in this country. And after the US Women's National Team won another World Cup, 
The stars are as popular as they have ever been before. 2020 was gonna be such a big year for the NWSL, but then the pandemic struck, which just turned everything upside down. But there's a reason why the league didn't fold after three seasons, or six seasons, or nine seasons. There's a reason why the league is continuing to add expansion teams like LA and San Diego coming in 2022. And there's a reason why there's more markets trying to get a piece of the pie. It's because the NWSL is actually working. And now, according to the Washington Post, most NWSL teams are valued between 20 to 100 million dollars. Now, I don't have the numbers of the WSA or WPS teams, but even with Mia Hamm, Brandi Chastain, Brianna Scurry, all the stars from 1999, I promise you, those teams were nowhere near worth that much. And so, I gotta say, I applaud the NWSL for making it as far as they have. Yes, a lot of work needs to be done still. They can't be complacent, I get that. But they're clearly doing something right, which is a lot more that can be said than about the WSA and WPS. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, and I'll see you next time.